Hi, good morning. Greetings from my couch in Turin, Italy. I am Vittorio Bertole and I'm here to talk about the European digital sovereignty. What it is, what are the problems that it is trying to solve and how can the open source community relate to it? I am an engineer, uh, I'm a digital rights activist since the mid 90s and I'm working currently for Open Exchange, which is a German open source software company, maybe you know DAVCOR, PowerDNS. And as a disclaimer, since I will be talking about specific companies, I want to say that I don't hate these companies or the people that work for them. This is just a, a recap of how this uh, situation is seen in Brussels by the institutions and by the European policy community. And uh, so, to, so to understand why certain regulation proposals are underway. So, Welcome to the Hotel California, as the famous song says. This story starts uh, in the 80s up to the mid 90s when there was no mass internet. We only had separate uh, BBSs or private uh, online services that were not interconnected with each other. And then the internet came and the uh, bright idea uh, for the internet was to uh, separate the different layers and standardize each layer separately so that you could have multiple applications running over the same network layer and also multiple networks interconnecting using the same network uh, layer. And um, the, the architectural principles of the internet, this is RFC 1958 from 1996, uh, were codified more or less uh, in, uh, in that period. And uh, there are two of them that are particularly relevant to this discussion. One is standardization, meaning that uh, once uh, someone does something and finds a good way to do something, everybody else should uh, do it uh, the same way, unless there is a strong reason to, to change, because this allows uh, all the different implementations to interoperate and, and you can replace one implementation with another. And uh, modularity is also uh, useful because it, uh, it means that you should break down whatever you are building into smaller modules so that you can then implement the different modules separately. And so uh, then you can replace individual modules uh, without replacing the other. And uh, these principles together form what we call interoperability. This system of uh, multiple uh, software, hardware uh, services uh, provided by many different makers and, uh, and providers uh, that, that are, I mean, all work together and you can interchange each other. So you can put together services by multiple providers and they all work, uh, work together. And if you're dissatisfied with one, you just change one and uh, keep the others. So the, the services that were born in this period uh, all follow this model. I mean, email is the best example. Uh, you just get an email address, an email account from one provider, and then immediately you can send email to anyone from any other email provider anywhere in the world. And anyone can offer email services. All the standards are open, are public. There's many free software implementations. And the same is for the web. I mean, the web is also built over this interoperable model. I mean, both browsers and servers interact and you, you just need one browser to communicate with uh, any possible website. And this was really one of the key factors for the success of the internet. And the internet went through a phase of explosive growth in the 90s and uh, at the beginning of this millennium. And this brought up uh, economic growth, startups, uh, wealth, but also social growth and the freedom of information and it to all corners of the world. It was really an outstanding success. And then after some time, let's say around 2010, more or less, new services started to appear. And in the beginning, it was great as well. I mean, we, we thought they would continue this tradition. But uh, then something started to happen, consolidation. So uh, the companies started to merge with each other and become, uh, started to become bigger and bigger. And uh, in, in the end, we ended up with very few companies uh, managing the services we use every day. Uh, smartphones came more or less in the same period and it was also a revolution and at the beginning you had one million different apps made by very small maybe uh, developers uh, there was a lot of choice and freedom of opportunities but then again after a while we, we ended up with uh, I mean like we are today just two basically mass operating systems for mobile devices and even among the apps uh, the, I mean most of the most uh, commonly used apps are owned by the same company uh, then the cloud claim, and the cloud again is the same, has the same problem. Well, it, the cloud is really someone else's computer. So, uh, and these computers are mostly owned by a very few companies, and usually the same that also own the other services. And this is also getting worse and more concentrated every day. So, uh, all these phenomena together created something that was never seen before in the history of mankind. For the first time ever, the five biggest listed companies in the world were all tech companies. There, there have always been big tech companies in history, but it never happened that all, all the big tech companies were dominating the scene at the global level over any under, other industry. And also this has, has, get, has been getting worse. So in, in 2016, the, the value was around uh, half a trillion dollars. In 2019, Microsoft went over the threshold of $1 trillion of value. And just uh, less than three years later, now we are uh, nearing the $3 trillion threshold. I mean, Apple is currently the biggest one. And uh, 
is basically Apple is almost worth three trillion dollars, which is equal to France's GDP, which means that I mean if, if all French people and companies work for one year and put together all their efforts and they build wealth, all that wealth can barely buy Apple, barely, maybe. And of course the other European countries are smaller, so they, except Germany. So, uh, so the situation is getting worse and worse. These companies are getting bigger and bigger. There's very few changes in this situation, except that Facebook now is called Meta, and uh, Tesla came in, and now Tesla is bigger than Meta. But basically, this is not getting better. And uh, another uh, factor of concern, especially for governments, is taxation. So this was an, uh, an analysis that was made a few years ago in Italy about the advertising revenues from Google, which, I mean, if, if you buy advertising as an Italian, uh, you, you don't pay Google Italy, you pay Google Ireland. And then Google Ireland sends back to Google Italy as, as a fee, basically just one seventh, more or less, of what they get, which is the only part that gets taxed in Italy after you take away all the costs of actually providing the service in Italy. And so the, the value that gets taxed and the, the amount in taxes is quite low and governments really don't like this. So this is one of the other concerns that has been that have been raised, also because of the systemic effect. So this is anecdotal if you want, but it's an interesting indicator. So if you, if you look at the price of houses in San Francisco, it has more than doubled in seven years. And if you know San Francisco, I mean, prices are totally crazy for, for almost everything. And this is one of the signs that there's all this immense amount of wealth that is from all over the world is concentrating into this very small area of the U.S. West Coast where these companies are located. And uh, everybody there is now, not everybody, but many people there are very rich and so that they, they want to buy a, a nice house and the prices go up. Uh, but, but this is really something that uh, worries the, the authorities in Europe because nobody likes to see all, all this wealth going away to another continent. And so this is Hotel California. Because as the song says, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. Because we are really stuck with the services of these companies. There's almost no way of living without it. I mean, maybe technical people like us can find a way, but it's hard and inconvenient and it's definitely not possible for the average internet users. And the way these companies continue this domination uh, is um, mostly related to how they build the, their services. So as a comparison with the original internet services like email and the web, we can consider the, the recent, the most recent wave or services like uh, instant messaging or social media. Instant messaging is a good example because all the instant messaging services are built as a walled garden. So if you have WhatsApp, you can only exchange messages with WhatsApp users. And if you then want to send a message to a Telegram user, you need to install Telegram, get an account on Telegram, and then the same for Facebook Messenger, for Slack, for whatever, spa, uh, whatever, uh, whatever other uh, messaging product. And um, so in this, in this way, it's very hard to build new services because even if you build a very good new instant messaging service, there, there, there are no users. So if someone tries it and say, okay, it's fine, it's very nice, better than the others, but there are, my friends are all on WhatsApp and on Telegram, and so why should I be using this? And uh, so it's, and by the way, it's also impossible to run your own. So you cannot run your own instant messaging server and because they, either the standards are closed or the deployments are closed. So maybe they use open standards, but they don't let you interconnect with their servers. And another common tactic is bundling. So this is especially strong in, in the mobile since you know, you have, we have only these two mobile operating systems and then maybe the platform also pre-installs you with applications for other services that of course they are the default and so you will use them and they are maybe integrated so they work better than competitors because they are more integrated with the operating system. And uh, it, it maybe you get one, you get many, so in the end, uh, the, 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 you, you, these are tactics that are used I mean, to expand the domination from one specific sector to other nearby services and applications. And so we ended up uh, in, in this kind of situation in which these companies have a lot of power under many ways. I mean, they, they buy out uh, competitors before they can challenge them. They can be used, as, as it happened with, with Android and Huawei, as a tool for geopolitical struggles. I mean, uh, even if they don't want their government, the US government can force them to, uh, to be part of this. Or, then, um, or they can just uh, get money from you, like Apple with their famous 30% uh, uh, commercial fee if you want to uh, make, uh, I mean, sell something from within an iOS app. And, um, and it, app stores are a particularly interesting example uh, because we never really had app stores on computers. We had package managers, but they don't ask you for money for when, when you want to buy something from the application makers and they don't want to check your code and decide whether they will let you install your application or even distribute your application to the users of your device. So this is a completely new model, which is just about control. I mean, at least this is my impression. If you go to the Apple website and you, you see the explanation, why do we have an app store? The first reason they give is that they do it for the kids. 
and maybe it's a valid reason, but you know, I, I've heard this for other things. If it's valid for this, maybe it's valid also for filtering child sexual abuse, but this is another discussion. So let, let's get back to the reasons for the concerns in Europe. I, I want to stress that this is not just a matter of money. So it's not really just about getting money or being greedy by governments or whatever. It's really a matter of surveillance, privacy, political power, control, national security. And there are many examples around this. So uh, first of all, advertising. I mean, in the last 10 years, the advertising market has completely moved from the offline world to the online world. So the online advertising companies, uh, starting with Google and Facebook, are now they're, they're collecting most of the advertising revenues. I mean, even Microsoft now makes like $8 billion dollars per year from advertising on Bing, meaning people use Bing, some do, and um, they, they pay for advertising and it's eight billion. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of money. And so we, we've come to the point that the surveillance capital is, is really the business model of these companies. So you might think that Google, for example, is a search engine company or an information uh, company. No, I mean, 70, now more than 80% of the revenues come from targeted advertising or surveillance advertising, as some, some call it. So it, it, their business is really advertising, tracking you and selling advertising. And Facebook even worse, I mean, like 100% or almost 100%. And as we see, in other, also the other companies, everybody has, has at least some money that comes from, from surveillance advertising. Uh, but it, it, this is really about also political power. So the governments in Europe were scared uh, a couple of years ago when all the COVID tracking apps thing came up and they realized that they did not get to choose the, the model, so the conditions under which they, they could actually provide a, a COVID uh, contact tracking, tracing app. Uh, because in the end, Google and Apple decided how it should be done. And even if some governments disagreed, they said, no, we, we are the ones that decide. And independently from whether you like the, I mean, one of the other models that were proposed, uh, the, but from a governmental point of view, this is really scary. I mean, you, even in such an important emergency situation, you don't, don't have the power to take a decision. And uh, another thing that uh, really scared European politicians, I mean, uh, when President Trump was banned from Twitter, yeah, I mean, Angela Merkel spoke uh, in favor of this, not be because she liked uh, President Trump, but because she realized that it's unacceptable that a private company gets to decide whether a, a sitting U.S. president has the right to talk with people in public or not. And uh, this is really part of the issue. I mean, this is a famous picture of uh, President Trump, the former President Trump, perhaps also the next one, we, we don't know, uh, with the CEOs of the big tech companies. Because, I mean, these companies are still, even if they don't like it, they are still in the U.S. and they are subject to U.S. laws and they are subject to U.S. interests. So I mean, we already know from the WikiLeaks case that the NSA was, I mean, square spying without many problems on European leaders, German, French, Italian leaders. And, uh, I mean, they are interested in this, and now there's even a, an open law stating this. So the Cloud Act is a U.S. law that says that any U.S. company, by, by this law, is required to share with U.S. law enforcement agencies any information of non-U.S. citizens uh, that it has access to, even if it's on servers that are outside of, of the U.S. So if uh, one of these companies has servers in Europe, but, but someone from the U.S. company has, has the passwords, the access to it, they are required to take any of our private information and give it to the NSA or FBI or CIA or whatever. And this is also an, it is a national security issue for, for Europe. It's, it's just unacceptable as a risk. And so this is also about, uh, the, as we were saying, that the models, the principles around the Internet. So it, it depends on how you interpret them. So the Internet was built over very, some very few innovative technical policy principles. You, you might have heard, for example, uh, about uh, permissionless innovation. Permissionless innovation is the idea that you, you should be able to deploy any new server, new software, new protocol, come up with something and offer it to users without having to ask for a license or a permission to a government or to a telco or to anyone else. So you just create your new service, your new website, whatever, you connect, you put it on a server, connect your server to the internet and immediately you are in business. And, and this was really one of the reasons why the internet had so much success, because it was the opposite of the original telecommunication models in which you had to ask for permission to operators and get licenses and pay a lot of money up front. And, and, and so, I mean, th there were plans for digital communications in the 90s by the telcos, but they were just uh, I mean, completely defeated by the, the, the speed through which the, the internet gained success. And... Uh, and so this was actually one of the reasons why we, we, came, we, we came up with the concept of network neutrality, which is another key principle of internet policies. Because at that point in time, we had this uh, still very big dominant telco operators, and we had very small 
starting up uh, internet companies. So even if the, the internet companies was, were much smarter and growing much quickly, much more quickly, then uh, th there was the risk that the telco operators would just uh, slow down their traffic and block them and control them just because of the control they had on the connections. And so we, we fought for this principle, which means that uh, the, the telcos do, do, do not get to gatekeep internet services and they have to provide the, the, same, the same service to everyone else. So they, they cannot, for example, tell you, you you're not going to connect uh, with YouTube, but you can only connect with the competing service because I like them or I, I get money from that. And then there's another principle which is very important, which is the liability exemption, meaning that uh, if you run a user-generated content platform, you're not legally responsible for the content that the users put on it, unless it's flagged you. So I mean, you, you explicitly know about it, and then you have to take it down if it's legal. But in the other model, I mean, it would be that you, have, you would have to check all the content as soon as you get it before you publish it, which is impossible to scale. So I mean, we would not have user-generated content if, if we didn't have this liability exemption. And finally, the, the most uh, cherished principle in the internet community is, uh, is possibly the, the, the well, it's, it's embodied by the so-called Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. It's, uh, it's a document by the mid-90s, which really says that we, we want to make the internet independent from governments. The internet defeats the governments and brings democracy to the world. It's a very noble, uh, noble set of thoughts. But really, in the community, there's this, still this rejection of rules, regulation, and governments thinking in, in borders. So the, idea, the very idea that you can have national governments with national laws is uh, culturally still uh, rejected by good parts of this community. So the problem we have now is that uh, all these nice principles, which were really important uh, for the creation and the growth of the internet in its early ages, uh, now are being used against us, against the users of the internet, much more than the governments. I mean, uh, because this, uh, I mean, the, the, the idea that, that you don't have to ask for permission to do anything has been used by this company to just do whatever is necessary for them to uh, preserve their dominant position. So they, I mean, they're basically like there are no rules and so they can do whatever they want, even if it's maybe not entirely fair. And uh, the, the fact that they are not responsible for the content, and now they, they basically make money out of fake news and propaganda and abusive material. And this is stuff that, it, I mean, it's stuff that has, uh, creates real problems for real people in real lives. So, I mean, there's people really being harmed in, in their real life by these this kind of things. So we, we should not dismiss it like, okay, well. And finally, the, the independence from governments means that these companies basically feel like they are above the law. And now they have a, a sheer economic size that actually makes them above the law in many cases. It's very, very hard to get them to do something that they don't want to do. Uh, maybe only the very big, the biggest country in the world have some kind of bargaining power. But uh, everybody else just gets whatever they want to do. And uh, and so I, I think we, we I, I still wanted to mention a, a couple of other things. Uh, one is about encryption. Uh, I, I think that we have to, I mean, we have to understand the, the, the real meaning of encryption in, in all this scenario. Because, I mean, we know that we have been spending collectively the last uh, 10 years encrypting everything uh, for good reasons. And uh, I want to state uh, immediately that I, I think that encryption is a good thing. We, we should absolutely encrypt all communications and definitely state-run backdoors are, are a bad idea. So I'm not absolutely arguing with this. And in the end, it's true that this is necessary to protect our communications. But I do want to challenge the, the idea that uh, this is also another traditional principle in our community, that more encryption always brings more privacy and freedom. This is just a simplistic idea. It's not uh, really completely true. It's not the whole story. And let's see why. I have examples from DNS, because that's what I do. But it's exactly the same for HTTP versus HTTPS or for any other encrypted protocol. So. As we all know, often the local DNS resolvers, which are subject to local laws in Europe or from, from your own country, are used as a control point by the ISPs and by the national laws for blocking content that they don't want you to see. They block Pirate Pay, they block Sci-Hub, they block Aurora Directa, whatever. And generally, we don't like this. And uh, so, I mean, what happened is that actually in countries that are much less democratic than Europe, so this is not from Europe. I mean, they had real reasons because that, that was real censorship, political censorship. And so they, they discovered that if they just move you to using the global resolvers that are located mostly in the U.S., almost entirely in the U.S. now, um, they would be able to bypass uh, DNS filters. And uh, But still, this didn't completely work because the traffic was still unencrypted. So the local ISPs on behalf of the government were still able to 
intercept the traffic, sniff the traffic, and uh, still block uh, connections or, or stop them from accessing whatever they wanted to access. And so recently, uh, some browsers, at least one of them, came up with this model. I mean, they basically, they just ignore, uh, want to ignore your own DNS settings, they ignore your own local resolvers, they just bring up an encrypted connection to a remote server, and they send all the DNS queries to the server that they chose and they trust and they chose it for you. And this makes uh, local control by the local government impossible. And in, in the cases of the dissidents in authoritarian countries outside of Europe, it's really a great thing. So this is a, a very good thing they are doing for, for that use case. But the problem is that, uh, well, first of all, local control is not always bad. I mean, th there are actually some good reasons for blocking stuff like malware and botnets, especially for the non-technical users, because maybe we are able to defend ourselves uh, from phishing, but maybe my 75-year-old mom is not, not, not that, that good at it. And uh, and so in the end, the, it's, it's also about them in controls, blocking material. There, there's many reasons why many countries or many people want to block stuff. But still, this is a, a matter of taste. There are people that uh, say we shouldn't block anything on a matter of principle, and that's a respectable idea. But the real problem is that uh, this is not just about a matter of privacy and freedom. So let's make the same example, but with a different use case. So the same control point that is used by the government or by bad governments to block uh, dissent and politically inconvenient content uh, can be used by governments uh, to, to block the websites that don't want to uh, adhere by the national rules. So it's actually the only one of the very few uh, law enforcement points when you, you have to deal with uh, websites or services that are uh, offshore, that are foreign, don't have a presence in your country, which, I mean, maybe the very big tech companies all have uh, subsidiaries in basically every country, but they, even just the slightly smaller services, they don't. And so you, you don't have a way to, uh, to act uh, locally. And so the only thing you can do is uh, to act on the, uh, on, on the connection and try to prevent these services from working in your country if, if you want to impose them anything, which could be good, something good for the users like uh, GDPR or maybe paying taxes. And so if, uh, in the end, if we move to this kind of uh, encrypted world in which uh, everything is, uh, is just flying over the heads of, of the local community and of the local government, then this becomes impossible. It becomes impossible to enforce the rules. But it's even worse. It becomes impossible even for us. So I don't know about you, but many of us have something called a pie hole in our homes, on, on a Raspberry Pi. It's a, a local DNS resolver which is configured to block uh, targeted advertising, tracking advertising. And it's a great thing. It's actually protecting your privacy. But if this model starts to happen and browsers start just to ignore whatever resolver and, 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 and sending encrypted information and getting the DNS remote, uh, resolved remotely, then ad blocking becomes impossible. And so uh, it, it's even new that you are losing control. So I think you, you're starting to see the point that I want to make is that th this discussion is not really just about privacy or censorship or whatever. And there's even more because the, this is now being used to centralize the traffic again and to promote the same consolidation that is, we, we've seen is a problem. So uh, now there's, uh, there's this uh, blameless connection model that is starting to be deployed. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, so I mean, basically all your traffic is sent through two proxies. It's a sort of a scaled down to two hops uh, version of Tor. And, um, and so the first proxy gets your traffic. It's encrypted with the key of the second proxy. So the first proxy sees your IP address, but they don't see your, uh, your actual traffic. The second proxy then gets it from the first. They see your traffic because they can decrypt it and send it on, but they don't see your IP address. And the final destination only gets a flow of aggregate, aggregated traffic from the second proxy. So in the end, they, they see even less. And so uh, this is, for example, what uh, Apple just implemented as the so-called uh, cloud private relay, which is an uh, add-on service at the moment, optional, you have to pay for it. And um, and in this case, they, they run the first proxy directly, and the second proxy is provided by the usual big CDN operators like Cloudflare, Fastly, Akamai, whatever. And they have a contract with each other. So what's the, the problem around this? It's not a problem. In many cases, it's a good service. So it, if you're concerned about your, your ISP or whatever tracking you, on, it, it's a way to hide your traffic, to reduce what websites see you, to increase your privacy. It's a sort of VPN. So, But there are cons in the long term that we have to consider. So first of all, you can't choose your proxy operators. I mean, you, you have to get the ones that Apple gives you, in, which is themselves. And the, the second, the most concerning one, is now all your internal traffic is going through Apple. And as long as the two first and second proxy don't cooperate, uh, then it's fine. But then in the long term, in a world where uh, basically the entire internet runs on surveillance, 
uh, who guarantees that Apple and their supplier will never cross match your metadata? Or maybe if others follow the same model, maybe Apple will not do it, but other companies, other, other device makers or whatever will, will do it. So for, for us as a user, we, we should at least discuss what, what are the guarantees? What, how can we make sure that this is not getting worse? And now I mean, we get one party that gets to see our entire internet traffic in, in, in addition to our I mean, ISP, which is doing the first one. So I, I think that I, I mean I, I wanted to show you that the point that, that I wanted to make that is uh, we should not be naive. I mean the discussion of encryption on encryption and on all the principles that I was mentioning should not be just I mean in, in terms of privacy freedom. I mean we should really care about control because encryption now is being used as a as a way to move the control points over the internet and it's really a power struggle between governments and private companies on uh, who gets to control and to have control points on what you do over the internet. And the, the, what I'm scared about is that we are slowly building what I call the Internet of Other People's Things. So we are basically filling our homes with devices that just bring up an encrypted channel to their servers, several the servers by their maker in some other country, somewhere in the cloud, and you don't get to see what they do. You as a user don't know what, what your devices are actually sending, and uh, you'd have no way to scrutinize it or to block it or even sometimes to know that. that and if you, if you manage to block it, then the device will stop working. And this is a terrible model. So it's disempowering. It's not disempowering governments. It's disempowering us, the, the end users. And we, we're really risking to end up in this kind of situation. This is from a famous film on the DDR. And uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. So and the final point is that at least we can vote for our governments. So, I mean, we don't like governments in general, but at least we, we do have a vote, we do have a say. We cannot definitely vote for Facebook CEO or for the CEOs and the, of these big companies. We, we really have absolutely no way to control what they are going to do with, with our own future. So I, I think I, I showed you a, a lot of reasons why in Europe there is concern around what is happening with the big tech and the direction that the internet is taking. So that the, the last part of the presentation uh, is about Europe running for the door, trying to find a way to get out of this situation. And uh, the, the talk is all about, and for the last two or three years in Brussels, has been all about digital sovereignty. So what's this concept? Well, it, it, it means two diff slightly different things. I mean, one is digital autonomy, meaning that you have as a country as, or as a space like Europe, you have to be self-sufficient. You have to be able to have all the technology and the services that you need on your own uh, grounds so that you don't depend on any foreign country, don't depend on um, international trade and whatever. And we've seen how international trade is fragile in these years. And uh, so you, you actually have to develop your know-how, your local industry and economy, so that you're autonomous. In case of need, you can survive without having to depend on, on other people. And this is the concept that is more, more, more common in Germany. The French concept, on the other hand, is more about sovereignty. So it's really about setting rules, enforcing rules, collecting tax and in general not be subject to pressure or whatever, uh, retaliatory potential, retaliatory action by any other country outside of Europe. So the, these two concepts uh, merge together, create what is, you say, the European concept of digital sovereignty. And here is when open source gets into play, because open source is really fit for this discussion. I mean, in Europe, we always get this question like, um, why is, I mean, why is Europe not able to produce Google? I mean, we don't have, I mean, we have very few of these very big tech companies. Why? I mean, what did we do wrong? What can we do better? And this is the wrong question, in my opinion, because Europe is different. Europe is really an archipelago of 27 different countries and languages and societies and markets, and it works by horizontal cooperation. So we, we create alliances of SMEs and national companies that work together from different countries and then try to, I mean, pro produce something which is, to, which is good for Europe. And, and so this is, uh, this is why uh, also our policy and our economic policy should be different. And in general, open source is, is a good fit for Europe. And in the end, there's an effective alliance between us and, and the European uh, institutions, I'd say, because we, we provide the technology and we provide the model for horizontal cooperation and the open standards. Well, Europe can put some funding, can put the, some consumer defense and can make the rules that allow us to, I mean, not to be uh, destroyed or I mean, mistreated by these big dominant big tech companies. So what we need is a regulated openness. We, we need the technical building blocks, and this is on us as a technical community to, to ensure that there are open standards, there are federation mechanisms, there are multiple implementations, open source software, we have to do that. But then we also need the, the governments to do the regulation. And we need regulation that mandates the dominant players to play by the rules, to get back to the original internal principles and so to work with interoperable uh, protocols and services and to let 
open source, competing open source solutions and even individual servers to interact with the big tech servers through interoperability. So interoperability, well, it's not the only remedy, but it's really the remedy to this situation of world gardens. Because if we can separate the modules and prevent this big tech company from giving us a monolithic platform that you have to use in its entirety, and we can uh, then ensure that they are interoperable so that you can replace just one of the modules and then it will work with all the others, then we will be able to create uh, alternative solutions and we will be able actually to compete. So even in, ter in economic terms, as, a, as an industry, we will be able to produce stuff and uh, that can compete uh, with, and maybe be even better than the one from the, from the big tech industry. So for, for example, I would much like to have just one instant messaging app, the best possible ones, the one I like more, I choose it freely. And then with that, I can communicate with users of all other instant messaging services, be it WhatsApp, Telegram, whatever Signal, whatever, whatever you want, even the new ones. And this would really allow people to work on it and create maybe new applications and then, and then have a chance to succeed. And so it will also enable competition and maybe enable us to have some more privacy-friendly services. We could pick some that are more privacy-friendly. So there's a, a lot of things that Europe is, has been asking in general with, with regulation. There are lots of new regulations coming and here is a big uh, recap. I mean, I will be quickly showing you a number of different uh, law proposals that you might hear about. We'll talk about the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act in a minute, but I want to mention the Data Governance Act, which is setting the rules for open access to public data. The Computer Chips Act, because uh, now Europe realized that if, if you cannot get your chips from China and Taiwan because there's no international trade anymore, then you're stuck and all the rest of the industry which needs electronics uh, just stops. And so they, they want to promote a, a bigger production of chips right in, the, in Europe, even if it costs more, because it's a strategic need. There's the minimum corporate tax directive. So there's now an agreement on the fact that corporates should be taxed at least 15%, or according to Ireland at most 15%, but 15% is the number. And so this will be implemented. There's a, a revision of the IDAS going on, so to get, we could hopefully sooner or later get uh, really working uh, open public identities. And then there's GAIA-X, which is an industry consortium with a weird name, which possibly makes sense in German, but not for other people. And um, But it's working basically to establish uh, common cloud standards so that for cloud portability, so that you could move your cloud applications from one cloud provider to another infrastructure provider without being logged in. And, and same for data ontologies, so that you can have services by multiple companies in the same uh, niche, and they can know how to exchange information and work together and create this kind of horizontal cooperation and to, to build a bigger service together. So then the Digital Services Act I mentioned, it, it, this is the re replacement for the old e-commerce directive. It's, it's under discussion, and so it's uh, still being discussed and will be finalized in the next few months. So the, the idea is basically this, that we will keep the basic principle, but uh, introduce some more liability, especially for what they call very large online platforms, Facebook, basically. So in terms of accountability and, and rules and checks uh, on how to close accounts and not to close accounts and these kind of things. Uh, but then the, the, the real core one is the Digital Markets Act. It's a specific regulation that's dealing with competition and creating more choice. And it's aimed at business users originally. Then, I mean, as I mean, meaning the digital rights NGOs and the open source industry from Europe managed to expand it because some of these rights should really be available to all end users, not just business users. And it's, it will affect only very few, very big companies. So only the so-called gatekeeper companies will, will be subject to it. And the gatekeeper companies currently, because this is still under finalization, are the ones that make at least 8 billion euros per year. So it's in, in Europe, in the European Economic Area. So it's, it's quite, quite a big amount. And then at least three European countries, at least for 45 million consumers, there's a number of criteria. So in the end, this is aiming to create a, a new antitrust instrument for this kind of non-traditional dominant positions, because the economists will insist that uh, Google and, uh, and Apple are not dominant companies in the mobile OS because there are two of them. I mean, everybody else agrees that there is a competition problem. So th this is the list. Uh, of covered services, it's an exhaustive list. So if something is not here, it will not be affected by this law. And uh, so the, you see there are marketplaces like Amazon or Booking.com, there are search engines, social media, video sharing, instant messaging, operating systems, including mobile, cloud computing services in general, advertising by any of these above uh, dominant players. And then the parliament recently added um, browsers, voice assistants and smart televisions. So this is the list, and, and remember, I mean, so basically only the gatekeeper companies and only the, the companies for these services 
will will be affected. I mean, everybody else, including startups, nonprofits, uh, smaller companies, will not be affected by by this act, if not by the benefits that they get from the rules imposed to the gatekeepers. So, what does this say? I mean, this act introduces uh, two types of. Um, of constraints. One is uh, Article 5, the ones that are immediately executable, and then Article 6 are stuff there. It's there, but it needs to be worked upon. And there's a list, I mean, you see that these are very reasonable things. So the, the, the must nots include, I mean, not to force users to accept that integration across multiple services, no, no best price clauses against the competition, no mandatory bundling, no, uh, no, no clauses, I mean, no mandatory use of the identity system. So, I mean, there's a number of things. Uh, but I want to come to the two key things that I, the two key problems that I identified, like bundling and, um, and interoperability. So these are the anti-bundling clauses. And these are what is in the text now that has been approved by the Parliament. I will end up, I mean, by explaining the process in, in a minute. So in the current version of the text uh, as approved by the Parliament, there's basically the, there's some very useful clauses. Basically, the, the dominant gatekeeper companies must allow you to, to use, at least the business users, to use the service without being forced to use the ancillary ones. So if, if you want to use Amazon's marketplace, you must not be required to also use Amazon's logistic service, for example, or, or identification. In the same way, one, you, you, must be to, you must be able to use one without the other. So you, you can use, uh, I mean, sell your stuff or put your videos on YouTube without having to, to use uh, the search engine or whatever, these kind of things. But the most important one was the last one that was added, in which now the, the provision is that whenever you install a new device, like a smartphone, the, the device has to ask you and give you a list, for example, of search engines and uh, say, okay, which search en engine do you want to use as your default search engine? And it must also not prevent you from uninstalling the, the, the platform's apps. So if you get Android, there will be the Google search app, but uh, you, you, you must be able to just remove it and, and install something else and the device must still be able to work. And then there's the interoperability clauses. Again, these are the current state of the art. Uh, there's, I mean, when we started one year ago, the original proposal by the Commission only had the, this interoperability for auxiliary services clause. So it was just about, uh, for example, letting you log in with a different identity system or using a different payment gateway or delivery or advertising, this kind of auxiliary services. Now there's, there's new, very, many new additions. One is about equal access to S features. So apps must be able to access uh, fairly or the same uh, the same APIs and libraries and whatever uh, that, 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 that the dominant players on apps uh, access. And then there are two classes for which we have been fighting a lot with some success. And uh, these are the interoperability for instant messages and for social media. We, we hoped that we would get interoperability for everything. We didn't get it yet, but at least we got it in these two very key important services. And so if this gets approved, the, the gatekeeper for these two services, which is the same company, so Facebook, WhatsApp, they will have to open up a, some kind of interface and interoperate with any other instant messaging and social media service. And of course, there's a lot of implementation questions and, and which are still to be discussed, but it's very important that this is a high level text in a row. You cannot write I mean, protocols in a row, but um, it's important that principle is there. And then there's a real time data portability clause. I mean, portability is already in the GDPR, but it's nice to get it uh, restated and expanded. So where are we? Well, uh, this came from a commission's proposal from one year ago. It was discussed for one year the, in the Parliament, and then the Parliament approved it on the 15th of December with 229 amendments that mostly expanded the scope and added some very good things. Now, but the problem is that now the, we are in the so-called trialogue phase in which the Parliament's approved text has to be negotiated with the Commission, with the original proposal, and with the Member States, the Council. So we are not sure that what we, is in there will even survive. There will be a final text agreed between these parties. The, French, the current presidency of the EU, which is France, is really pushing the, for political reasons. They want to approve it before the end of the presidency in June. But then it will go to the parliament and the parliament will have a final vote and approve the final text. So there are companies and NGOs, well-known ones, that are doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that at least what, what we got in these clauses stay in the final text. And we hope we will succeed. We don't know yet. But please, focus. if you want to support us, please uh, contact me. I'm happy to discuss this. So this brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope it was interesting. I'm happy to discuss it. So please, and uh, also to answer any questions you might have. So thank you for listening and uh, let's have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 
since you have answered uh, most of the questions in the chat, I will try to pick the one that uh, were missed. So Benjamin Balderbatch asked, uh, can you reflect on matrix and government EU interest afterwards? How is it going in Germany with matrix implementation and others following? Um, are you governments reasonably scared of hosting their communication infrastructure on Teams, Zoom, Zoom Meet, uh, etc.? Well, yes, matrix is basically the alternative. And uh, I mean, basically, Matrix is, I mean, Element is also one of the companies that has been working with me and other European companies to push this. Yeah. But also, I mean, just to educate, because it's true that the European decision makers often don't know that even their very governments, like in France or in Germany, are using Matrix for, for their services. And so, I mean, so in the end, uh, there will be an implementation phase in which someone, which is still to be understood, will have to pick the actual protocols. So there will be a decision whether, I mean, in case we, which falls, for example, for WhatsApp to open up an interface, whether they should just bring up an API or whether they should be required to use an open protocol, which is what we are pushing for, and then the matrix could be selected as that. But uh, this will happen afterwards. At this point in time, the important thing is to get this. And in terms of infrastructure, yes, I mean, it depends on the country. There are countries like Germany where the discussion on not hosting stuff on US uh, service services or, uh, or servers has been going on for quite a long time now. There are other countries in which they, I mean, the discussion doesn't exist and the government just isn't aware or doesn't care. So, I mean, it really depends on your specific. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, Kale Sin also asked, uh, the Digital Market Act uh, seems to be very corporated oriented. Uh, what about stuff run by the public, for the public, and no money involved? Well, indeed, it, it, it's justified. I mean, it's very business oriented because of the way the EU works. So, the, the European uh, Parliament and Commission can only make uh, regulation on, on what the, the state have given to Europe as a competence. So I mean, business, uh, the internal market is one of these. So I mean, they can do laws that are uh, keep the market alive and make it work better. Other things are maybe not under the purview. So for example, stuff like filtering is not a European competence. It's just the individual counties that make uh, laws on deciding to block or not to block stuff. So that, that's maybe, that is reflected in the way the laws work. But in the end, if we can open up the, 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 the domain and services to interoperability and uh, uh, remove the problems with planned bundling and closed app stores and whatever, everybody will benefit. So even the non-profit uh, services, the community projects will be able to interoperate and then they will be able to grow. So in the end, the benefit is for everyone. Thank you. Um, Jim Klimov also asked, um, I wonder about inter-messaging uh, interoper interoperability. Uh, if some user talk on the chat uh, whose tech they trust as a secure, does adding an account from another platform or just assistance of a bridge without other platform chatters undermine a security? Well, that's your choice. I mean, interoperability creates uh, interfaces that can be used by your app to communicate. But then if you don't want to send messages or receive messages from users on other platforms, you just will possibly be able to tell to your client that you don't want to receive them. So it is still your choice who you communicate with. So in the end, I mean, social media might be slightly different, but even there, if you move to a separate platform is more privacy friendly, then at least you're gaining privacy in the realm of what you do, because most of the interesting metadata are around, for example, what you're watching, how much time you spend on different posts and what they're talking about. And that's stuff that you can prevent at the other platform from going simply by using a privacy-friendly client. And so, so there's a gain in privacy anyway. And then the, the important thing is that as a user, you will still be able to control to, to which extent you want to inter interoperate. Uh, thank you. I don't think there are any questions left. Uh, thank you for the talk and the answers. Thank you for listening. And of course, drop me email or find me on Twitter or whatever. I'm happy to continue this discussion.